Would you like to know what Dr. Gordon Christensen recommends for PPE, surface decontamination, air filtration, extra oil scavenging, and more? Gordon is my guest today, and what you're about to hear is likely not what you expected. But it's a point of view that needs to be heard by dentists overwhelmed with conflicting information. Gordon's is an unfiltered voice of reason, which just may change the way that you think about practicing dentistry in the new normal. And we're starting right now. And now, Amazon number one best-selling author, Dr. Tom, the Jim's Guy Orant. Dr. Gordon Christensen is founder and CEO of Practical Clinical Courses and Clinicians Report Foundation and a practicing prosthodontist in Provo, Utah. Gordon and Dr. Rella Christensen are co-founders of the nonprofit Clinicians Report Foundation, previously known as CRA. Gordon helped initiate the University of Kentucky and University of Colorado's dental schools, and he taught at the University of Washington. Currently, he's an adjunct professor at the University of Utah School of Dentistry. Gordon, thank you so much for joining us here today. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic, and you look good. How, how are you feeling? I'm doing great. I appreciate your asking. Um, you know, as we re-enter, the practices, the, the dentists have so many questions, reducing or mitigating the effects of aerosolization is, is clearly one of those main focal points. We're, we're getting back into practice post-COVID, and we're seeing so many options for the, the extra oral scavenging systems, and they range from, I've seen one doctor with a $1, $1 funnel that he bought at Home Depot and he taped it to his high volume suction uh, to very, very expensive high-tech, the standalone systems. And my question would be, which ones are most effective and, and what should the dentist be doing about scavenger systems? How long do we have on this? <laughs> as long okay. as you want. We, we uh, I don't know how many hundreds of questions we get on that. That's the same thing you just brought up. And uh, we have been on that topic now for 25 years. I'm gonna start out positively with that research and then I'll get quite negative. Uh, what we're seeing is the best way to reduce up to 95% of the aerosols is proper use of the high velocity suction system. And that what that means is not pulling the organisms up uh, many dental assistants will come in and put the the high velocity watch my hand at an angle about like I have my hand. What does that do? Pulls them all up right into your hair and the rest of the room. They should be going horizontal with the occlusal plane. If they're going horizontal with the occlusal plane and they're very close and they're not splashing water all over everything, 85 to 95 percent of the aerosol that's created is gone. Now that's 25 year old research. The companies don't want to hear that because they're selling these things routinely. I'll just give you a few things as to how to reduce the aerosol before we go into the, the fantasy of these things they're buying right now. If they use high velocity suction, that's got most of it. Uh, and uh, that is highly advantageous. Now what else? You don't have to use water on a small prep. That research is 60 years old. University of California did it on, on a small class one, small class two with a sharp burr and high velocity suction. You make no aerosol. It well, there's just a little bit. Uh, if you use just air cutting and uh, I've been doing that for many, many years. I don't like it because it has a certain stench to it. But if you're using the uh, high velocity suction, even that's gone away. So anything small, a class five, a little class one, a class two, you don't need an enormous amount of water. You can't see what you're doing anyway. Uh, University of California used that philosophy forever. For, I'm talking 50, 60 years ago. And it's carried on through that time on small things. The water lavage uh, is, uh, has been well overdone. You're going to heat the tooth up if you cut dry. In your freaking dreams, frankly, you cool the tooth one to two degrees centigrade just by the air coming out of the handpiece. So, uh, and if if you have something, you can turn the air off. You don't even have to have air blowing on there on a small prep. Uh, well, anyway, there's another way. What else can you do? Uh, you can use a rubber dam. 
And I know I'm only talking to 6% of the population of Dan. It's six. That's pathetic. If they're not using a rubber dam in Endo, uh, they better get ready for a lawsuit because that is standard of care. In operative, it's elective. Now, what's the second best? Uh, Isolite. Isolite 2. The original Isolite was cumbersome to put on a little bit more of a difficult situation. The Isolite 2 holds the mouth open, keeps the tongue out of the way, sucks, and has a light on it. What more do you want? The only thing it does not do, the rubber dam does, is retract the gingiva, which we're not really talking about in this discussion. So uh, rubber dam, Isolite 2. you got to put a little money into Isolite 2. Some of you won't like that. Now, what else can you do? There, there are quite a few things. The uh, dental assistant has to be aware of every time you use the hand, no, pardon me, the, the air gun or water spray, that dental assistant has to be in there, even if, if, even if air alone is going on, there, the dental assistant should be there with the suction to take it away, whatever droplets are, are occur. I just gave the group listening probably more by many times than they're going to get by a multi-thousand dollar gadgets sitting in your office or a group of gadgets, one in every operatory, which basically just pull in the debris, filter some of it out and throw it out the other end and it's continuing to come without, you can't control it. So uh, to spend an enormous amount of money on all the stuff that's being highly advertised, the, the ones that are really a joke are the ones that look like an elephant trunk. They come up close to the mouth and suck away whatever comes out of there. The, the problem is, where do I put my head? There's no headroom there. Well, let's pull it away. What just happened? It pulled it out into the whole room. Unbelievable, unbelievable. It takes about 40 IQ to figure that out. You'd have to put it right on the mouth to do any good. If you pulled it away far enough to have your head in there, there's my head. I'm not that close, I'm clear out here. Where did that, where did it go? All around it. Oh, let's use a face shield. Mm-hmm. What does the face shield do? You look like a space cadet. You can't get your dang goggles through it. And if you, if you do get your, your uh, loops through it, the loops have holes around them and the stuff comes right in through. Uh, let's face it, it's got to be a very well-fitted face mask, which I'm sure you're going to ask me what that is. But the face mask, pinched over the nose, pinched under the chin, sealed around the edges, that's how you get it away. And then some big glasses on. I'm a motorcyclist. Uh, you could even put motorcycle glasses on, you'd be far better than that miserable plexiglass shield that some of the states are requiring. What idiot did that? Uh, where, where does the aerosol go? Comes out of the mouth, all around the edges, and gets all over you anyway. Wow. There's so much fantasy out there, it, it's pathetic where we are. Uh, we've been doing research on this very topic now for over 25 years. And to see it repeated, 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 and now exacerbated to the point where dentists are spending, wantonly spending money, uh, we need to calm it down, literally. Long well, answer. It's not only a long answer, it's a wonderful answer because I am 110% certain that it is very different than what they thought they were going to hear. So, um, oh, no, yeah. very much so. I appreciate that. Next question, and this is still on the scavenger question, but slightly different. Should we be placing scavenger nasal masks on the patients? I see a lot of pluses and minuses in the media about that. And what, what's your take on that? Uh, well, you think about it logically, and you, you see, uh, yes, that's one way one way to operate. In the meantime, uh, now, how do you really operate adequately with this thing on the patient? I would say at this particular point from our research, no. I've already given you about 80 to 95% reduction in aerosol with very simple things. To add another I just looked at a patient this morning where it looks like I'm going to do a rehab. How am I going to get all this garbage and let's get that elephant trunk right on the nose? Uh, it's impossible to do dentistry. We've been living through how many, I call them pandemoniums, 
I, I grew up as a child during the Second World War. I was terrified, terrified. Uh, they, we were afraid they were going to bomb us. It was all kinds of things. Uh, my wife lived on the West Coast. They were even having blackouts and all. I thought the world was ending. That was number one. Then along came polio. I lived through that. I didn't have polio, but uh, couldn't even go in anybody's house or anything. Uh, far worse than what we're looking at right now in uh, crippling and uh, you know, involving more people. Then we lived through what? SARS and MARS and <laughs> HIV AIDS. And, and, and we're in a frenzy over this one? Yeah, people die. People die, 100,000 of them in the US. But about half of those wanted to die anyway. Do you realize what I'm saying? They're in nursing homes, sitting waiting for the bus to come, the dang thing won't come. They're ready to go anyway. I'm not saying, uh, you know, I'm in that age range, but and it sounds ruthless to say, say what I just said, but a lot of them just sit there snorting oxygen, eating Tootsie Rolls, waiting for the bus to come. You know what? And that's a major part of the deaths. If you took that 100,000, I don't, I don't have the data and I don't want to give a number, but I'm sure it's a huge number had uh, underlying conditions that made them die. Are there very, very, uh, are, are the children dying? Obviously not, obviously not. And if you look at the international data, uh, the international data is hard to understand. If you if you go on the internet and you watch, okay, we've had so many deaths, we've, uh, we've had so many reported cases, and you try to figure that out, it comes out five or six or eight percent, depending on the data, but they add a five or six or eight percent to it to think, uh, for those people they did not estimate had it, and you're down to, you want to hear this number, 0.4 of 1%. We were worse than many of the other pandemoniums. So I would have to say uh, in a somewhat of a, a generic summary, wake up, we've been through these before. Uh, we don't have to have a lot of this stuff that's being promoted by the profiteers, and that's exactly what I call them. A company jumps on it, another one sees they're making money, another one jumps on it, another one, and before long, you, I don't even know how many sucking machines we've got now that are uh, promoted on the internet. And you can blow thousands of dollars into it. I've already given you a way to get rid of around 90% of it. Which in a large way um, is, is the reason that we're having this discussion now because I've heard from so many of our members and, and doctors from our YouTube channel that they just don't know what to do. And so many of them, unfortunately, have already purchased or pre-ordered so many different systems. So uh, More than 50 percent. Yeah. So I, I appreciate your candor on that, because um, as we discussed yesterday, this is a moving target. Things are changing. But I think when we look back at it, you're going to be spot on on that. Another big area of change uh, that I'm hearing about is the air purification systems. And some doctors have been replacing and upgrading their entire central, the HVAC systems. They're handling systems not only to accommodate the HEPA filtration, but you can't just add HEPA filtration without increasing airflow handling in order to power it through the increased filtration. It's a nightmare. So they're turning you know, the room air over. They got to increase the frequency of that. Um, other than installing you know, freestanding HEPA filtration systems in every room. What's the bottom line? What should doctors be doing about, if anything, about air purification? Okay, okay. Well, if, if this was the first time this ever happened in the history of dentistry, uh, I would be far more concerned. But it's happened again and again and again and again. I've repeated several of them. And I left out quite a few of the major ones. So we've been through this before. And yes, this is a very fatal disease, several times more the, than the typical flu. However, we have had HEPA filters in our research labs now for many years, 25, 30 years. The HEPA filter that works best, and I hate to give a brand name, but I'm going to. Company, and this is not, not me, but the name of the company is Gordon. And uh, it is uh, basically a filtration. If you go on the internet and look at it, you'll see hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of uh, HEPA filters. But in our research rooms years ago, we finally decided we're going to put the HEPA filter above the patient. So what does it do? It pulls all the junk up and filters it up there and throws it out somewhere in the office. But we have had even Petri dishes sitting around in the room 
and we still can't culture much out of it because it's pulled everything up away from the patient. So a HEPA filter sitting on the floor does no good at all. A HEPA filter above is a desirable thing, let's face it. But let's say you're a dentist in uh, New York City in a building with 500 other dentists and no windows. What are you going to do now? You're stuck. Uh, almost impossible to make that HEPA filter have much of a value other than it's just spread the organism somewhere else. I, I would suggest that uh, having been through a number of these things before, that we look logically at what's happening. Is this that much different? And the answer is no. We've made aerosols forever, ever since Albert Thompson invented the so-called wash field technique in the late 50s, early 60s. So aerosols aren't new, neither are pandemoniums or pandemics or whatever you want to call them. They're not new at all. Uh, we're just dealing with a frenzied press. What we ought to do is put a dirty sock in every one of their mouths uh, and just shut them up. You know, they've exacerbated this to the point where we think the end of the world is here. It's not here. We've been through it before. Now, there are some things we can do to better what we've been doing. And I'm sure you're going to ask me that. What can we do to make it better than we have been? It's interesting that you mentioned the press. Um, you've got so many different sides, sides that are looking to make money on it. One of which is, as you mentioned, all the companies who have every different device under the sun. And the other is the media for, for obvious reasons. So I've seen doctors who have scavengers in the room. They have in-room HEPA filtration on the floor, as you mentioned, which is probably not a great idea. And um, one thing that they did do though, and this was interesting, so I'd like your comment on this. They had put fans in the room, which basically went across the patient. So anything supposedly that was missed by the, um, uh, the high volume was blown in a direction towards the HEPA filtration system. So can you comment on that setup? Yeah, that, that setup is, is viable. But on the other hand, it's still blowing it toward the floor, uh, which is a challenge. Uh, the best place for the HEPA filter is in the ceiling, uh, right above the op uh, where the operation is going on. But that means if you got six operatories, I don't have to tell you what's going to happen. you got six HEPA filters pulling the, the garbage up into the ceiling rather than pouring it onto the floor. Am I doing that? We have it in our research labs, but I do not have that in the in the operatories uh, because of things we've already discussed. Uh, we've been through it before. There are some things we can do though to control better than we have been controlling uh, a lot of this debris. Before COVID-19, the uh, ultrasonic scalers, uh, Cavitron and so forth, played a, a major role in most hygienists' care when they were treating patients with heavy calculus buildup. And given the level of aerosolization that's created by the ultrasonic scalers, do you see them using them in the near future? And if so, how? <laughs> well, I, I'm literally using the old phrase between a rock and a hard place right now because uh, one of our hygienists loves ultrasonic scaling and she just about drowns the patient. I, I, I basically have complaints about that hygiene. They love her, but the, the gasp as she gets in there with water going all over. You know what we've told her? No ultrasonic scaler for a while. Let this calm down. There, there are hand pickers, by golly, and they work. And they actually go between the lower anterior teeth where you can't get zipped with that ultrasonic scale or you just leave the garbage on till the next six months. So uh, we're calming our hygienists down. The, the, the one, one, we have three and one of the ones we use has never really, really used ultrasonic scale. Uh, if you lived in the Middle East or somewhere where there's a lot more calculus than we have, it would be mandatory here when they come in with a little bit on here and there and everywhere. Your hand scalers are far better. Now let's go back to normality. The use of both the ultrasonic to take the heavy garbage off, followed by a hand scaler, one that sharpened, by the way. We did a study of hygienists a while ago, and we found that, <laughs> you don't even want to hear this, that the majority of hygienists, uh, how often do you uh, sharpen your instruments? Huh? Some of them would say, well, we send them away to get them sharpened when they go. Or uh, one actually said, well, about once a year, they're just obscene things. They should be at least observed carefully and scratch on a fingernail every day you go in. 
Uh, if that happens, that's far better. And uh, look, look at how old I am. I've had scalings every six months my entire life. I still have teeth. Look at that. They're still in there. Uh, so the, some think that the, the hand scaler is going to destroy the teeth. It can, but used judiciously, it certainly does not. Uh, we're calming them down to answer your question. And uh, at least during the, the crisis, self-made crisis, we will state to patients, that, as you know, there are three things that really are the culprits. Number one is the ultrasonic scale. That's it. That's the aerosol. Number two, the hand piece, and that can be cut down enormously, enormously. Less water spray, dry cutting, semi-dry cutting with horizontal evacuation of the garbage. And what's the third one? The ultrasonic scaler. Scaler, I said it wrong. Cleaner, the ultrasonic cleaner in the laboratory. Uh, and I know you're gonna ask me something about labs, which are hopeless. Uh, the <laughs> we'll, we'll get there. Okay, the ultrasonic cleaner, if you happen to leave the lid off, even when you first turn it on, if you happen to leave the lid off, you would have to change that solution every patient to make that not, not pathogenic. So who does that? Nobody. Therefore, uh, put the lid on for sure, and even then it leaks around the edges. It's one of the most it's the biggest cesspool we have in the office, literally full of every organism you can imagine struggling to stay alive <laughs> because there's so many other friends in there with it. So th those three things, if you could control all three somewhat, but you can't, the ultrasonic scaler is the worst offender by far. Uh, by the way, I love your uh, your term, the, uh, the current pandemonium. That's, uh, that's a great term. So. In the early days of this pandemonium, as you say, there was a lot of talk about creating negative air pressure rooms. And oh, yeah. although, you know, I've seen a few dentists working on it for the most part, at least for now, it would seem as if the, the dentists aren't gonna be required to do it. So let's put the requirement aside. Do you feel it would be prudent? And, and based on what you've said so far, I think I already know your answer, but do you think it would be useful or prudent to create negative air pressure operatories or is it unnecessary overkill? I'll start with the answer, unnecessary overkill. However, there are patients for whom you're highly concerned. They have diseases of all sorts, and uh, we have no idea what's coming out of their mouth. Uh, I just heard that one of my ex-dental uh, assistants has cancer in every lymph node in her body. Unbelievable. And uh, she's a 45-year-old woman. You, you don't know what else she's carrying. So if I'm having to treat this person, I would like to take her, and here's the answer, to a hospital prepared for such situations with negative knowledge, pulling all the junk out as we're making all these aerosols and blowing air here and there. But in a dental office, what are we talking about? Yes, it would be nice. We could wear a diving helmet. We could, uh, there was a thing in uh, Europe, and I'm not kidding, Years ago, they called it the Euro Dead. It was only for males. You hooked up all your appendages to it, and you could just sit there all day with a thing like a, a diving helmet on and not even have any aerosol. Of course, by the end of the day, you figure you'd rather be a cab driver and just get out of that, that environment. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbe unbelievable. Gordon, let's shift gears a bit. Uh, let's away from aerosolization to, let's talk about surface decontamination. There seems to be a lot of discussion about, and again, I, I don't know if you can imagine, you probably already know how many dentists have already been purchasing foggers that have hypochlorous acid to decontaminate the surfaces in between every every two patients. So what, what if anything, I shouldn't say if anything, because I'm sure they have to do something. What should dentists be doing about decontaminating the surfaces between patients? <laughs> Uh, I could talk a day on this and all the fantasy that has occurred over the years. I'm going to say something that will upset some people right now. During the Reagan administration, and that would be in the 80s, the states and, and national government were evaluating uh, infection control projects. They had state labs, they had national labs, and I loved Reagan, but on the other hand, uh, this was a budget cut, and they, they cut out all 
of that unbiased, indifferent kind of evaluation. So how do they get a product evaluated? And I'll bet nine tenths listening to this have no idea what I'm going to say. Uh, let's say you're a company making a surface disinfectant. You go to a, a local company or a national company who uh, evaluates uh, infection control and you purchase their time to evaluate your product. Are you getting some ideas already? Uh, <laughs> it, it sounds like a pre-flawed system, but go ahead. It's the wolf loose in the chicken house. That's the best analogy I can give you. So anyway, they get some data, data. And it, it's based on what? It's based on EPA requirements. And now I'm going to say this slowly so it comes over. Usually in those tests, there is no bile burden involved. In other words, they'll take the bug or the virus or whatever and try to deactivate the virus or kill the bug, which hangs on, uh, the, the virus hangs on to the, the, the something that's live, as you know, the virus is not live or it's still questionable, but they don't think it is. So they will just kill that with, you could kill it with bad breath if you wanted to. Uh, now let's add blood. Some of the companies will use horse serum. What's horse serum? Well, first of all, it's a horse, it ain't a human. Secondly, they've taken all the cells out of it, which makes it what? Literally water. And uh, they'll put the, uh, the organism in that and kill it. Is that even remotely clinical? Not at all. Now, how, how many of these droplets that we produce have some form of blood in? All of them. Seldom would you have anything unless you took the water syringe and blew it right into the mouth. They've all got blood in. Try to find an EPA suggested test, an FDA suggested test that uses bio burden. We've been testing these under bio burden now for over 25 years and guess what? There are only a couple of surface disinfectants in all of the many we tested that actually work. One was Lysol, and that was until a few years ago when, uh, well, they had uh, over 70% ethyl alcohol in them, and uh, that would kill an organism on the surface, and the organism obviously has hanging on it viruses. That would kill in about, uh, well, uh, if they're a thin layer of bio burden, it would be one minute but three minutes maximum. California's got upset and said, our assistants don't like to breathe the fumes. Well, yeah, but you'll drink it tonight, you idiot. Uh, so you, you better think about it. You'll drink it, but you won't breathe it. What the heck are we talking about? So guess what? California passed the law and that took this alcohol down to somewhere in the 60% range which now requires 10 minutes on the surface. And then you have to wipe it off and put another one on because you wiped it first. And that's a, that's a wrong CDC recommendation. The CDC still says, wipe off the debris. What did you just do when you wiped off the debris? You spread this all over the entire countertop. No, you should use the disinfectant on a cloth to wipe the debris. Now you picked it up in this rag, throw it away, and then you hit it again. But that means two, and then you have to, who's going to do that? Some are taking products like Saran Wrap and others, we're doing that. Uh, the only problem with Saran Wrap, it, it's, uh, it sticks to everything, obviously, and uh, it's hard to pull off if you get it wrapped around some intricate little object. But, but it does block totally if you take it off right. You can't pick it up on the top, you pick it up on the sides and fold it over. Now, what else? Uh, ethyl alcohol is about it. The CDC is recommending Clorox. Oh, good. I like my whole office to smell like a nursing home or stale cat urine. And they're, they're diluting it to the point where it is almost useless. Toilet water might be better. Uh, you need a one-to-one -one dilution of Clorox right out of the bottle, excuse me, right out of the bottle to be effective. And who wants one-to-one -one dilution? You got white spots all over your clothing. Your office has a real stench to it. What a stupid, and I'll say it, recommendation. Yes, it would work. You could 
put Clorox all over your body if you wanted to kill everybody. But uh, no, that, that, that's not even viable. Some have tried benzoconium chloride. It has to be so concentrated that it becomes a true poison. Others are using uh, sodium hypochlorite. Oh my gosh, that would have to be really potent. Not, not, not what we, even what we're using in endo, stronger than that. Uh, I don't know what to say. Ethyl alcohol works. We showed it 25, 30 years ago. Nobody wanted to listen. Uh, and uh, now there's only one true brand that works. I hate to use one brand. That is BioSurf, B-I-O-Surf. BioSurf, it comes out of a little company in Canada. And um, the man who owns that company, how do you get on an EPA list? They don't approve, they don't clear as FDA does. They have a, a list of disinfectants. I just saw it again, there are 200 on there. Most don't work, period, in the presence of BioBird. Now, yeah, they'll kill a bug sitting on the top of the counter with no BioBird on it, but put the blood in, which we've got in every droplet you produce just about, and now you got the problem. So if alcohol kills, there are other things that will kill. Uh, on the other hand, uh, there, there's a negative we've already discussed. The, what, what are we suggesting? The BioSurf is at the level that Lysol used to be. Lysol out of the grocery store. And uh, it's hard to get now because, uh, I guess because of us, and I hate to have one product. There's one other product in Canada, but uh, that, uh, that product is not available in the U.S. BioSurf is the only one available in the U.S. Uh, it's not on the uh, Canadian EPA list because the guy senses very, very carefully what I said about how the evaluations are done. And a little bit of a challenge there. FDA does not test products. They clear products, which says what? That says they've looked at it. It doesn't look like it will kill you. Therefore, go ahead. But as far as testing them, no. Neither, neither agency does. There's no governmental agency that tests infection control products at this point. As I said, that died in the 80s. And until the government wakes up, literally wakes up, and quits making quite so many bombs and puts federal money into our own public, not just killing other people, we could have had this thing controlled so fast if they were ready. You think about what's happening. No ventilators, no masks, They're just ridiculous things. Where have we been? I have to blame it directly on uh, the, the oversight, let's call it that, of the government and not being prepared for what they knew was coming. How many of these do we have? Many, many. It was time to get these things prepared. Pull them out of a warehouse, we wouldn't be able to send them in right now. So, surface disinfectant, good luck, boy. Good luck. Uh, yeah, let, let's say you have uh, clearly some smear on some countertops. You can avoid that by saran wrap or some other thing on the top of it, by the way. And you're going to wipe it off with a, a cloth without disinfectant? No. You put the disinfectant on, on the cloth, wipe it off, you let it sit. And that's going to take one to three minutes with BioSir. Then uh, you do it again because you just wiped it off with the first rag. The second one is the disinfectant. That's another three minutes. One of our sons, uh, we have two dentist sons in the family. One of them practices in Canada. He went to school in the U.S., but then he married a Canadian woman. She dragged him up there. He thinks 40 degrees below is a good day. He's in northern Canada. And uh, that province of Ontario, some of you might be in Ontario listening and you need to shake up your, your Royal College of, I call them sturgeons. Why? Because they're requiring three hours for an operatory to sit after you take somebody out of there. Oh, that won't even pay one assistant for the day with all you can do. As some, some of the states are now requiring one hour for the operatory to sit. What are we thinking? What are we thinking? If we'd never been through this before, I could agree with it, probably, at least for a little while. But right now, it's not only ridiculous, it's absolutely absurd what we, what we see. 
it's surface disinfectant then is fairly fairly easy if you stay with Ohio for outdoors. I, I think absurd, absurd was a, um, the appropriate word. Short of moving entirely to optically scanned impressions, um, what steps should the doctors and team take to disinfect the labs and ensure that cases shipped and received are, are free from viral threat? Are you talking about just digital or are you talking about conventional? Well, conventional, because with with digital, okay. I think we're good. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is what it, one of the advantages of digital is they definitely you just go click and it's off to California and somewhere else. So that is a significant major dis, uh, uh, advantage. Now, we've done a lot of research on impression jets and you won't like hearing it. The vinyls can be disinfected very well, very well and they're not distorted. The vinyls, vinyl polysiloxane. The polyethers cannot be disinfected adequately without distortion. I, I had a, a trip go to Europe to confirm that with a lot of the research we had done. So you take Impagum, Polygel, perm, uh, Permadine, others that are polyethers, and uh, you, can, you can put them in there and take them out fast, but I don't know if you've done any good at all. You can spray alcohol and then dry it out fast so it doesn't distort it, but polyether cannot be truly disinfected well. Vinyl can. That's one of the reasons why I've stayed with vinyl all these years. I do use polyether for removable because I like the uh, high, high felicity, which it, it is, as you know, the best. Uh, now, what about algae? Are you kidding? There's nothing you can do with that other than spit on it or do something. I don't know what you can do to, to make it any, any better or worse. Uh, I usually suggest to laboratory technicians who are pouring that, uh, I'll say, well, we wear gloves all day. What's wrong with you? Stick some gloves on and, uh, and turn some cold water on and, and douche it out real well. Subsequently, uh, now this is something you dentists need to hear. Uh, get some plastic sandwich bags, Ziploc or whatever brand you want, and uh, wash out the, get all of the uh, mucus and blood and whatever out the algae in it. And then uh, put it in that little plastic bag, two drops of water, and it'll go many hours before any distortion takes place. But then the lab tech ought to be wearing gloves to pour it because there's no real way to disinfect that. So what did I really say? Thank goodness, uh, polyethers are 80% of impressions. And digital is only 15%, one five, 15% right now. So it, it's there, but, uh, and it's growing. It's, it is the future, but it's not a major part of what we do now. So impressions are a challenge. And now here, you won't like this one. Uh, our last survey showed of thousands of dentists that only 43% reported that they were disinfecting their impressions. 43% of the respondents. Now, can I trust that? No, probably half of those are, are lying. So uh, it's a very small fraction are being disinfected at this point. Uh, the major challenge is the lab tech <laughs> because they're the ones that get, uh, get the bloody cotton rolls and the other mom on pressions. That's just amazing. Um, let's talk about <clears throat> what the doctor and the clinical team members should be wearing. I'm, I'm seeing and hearing just about nearly nearly full coverage PPE. They're covering their hair, their scalp, their, their booties to cover the shoes. The shoes should never leave the office. The gowns need to be past the knees. And then the face masks and the shields and the gloves. I mean, looking at these, they literally look like hazmat situations. So what if anything in, in the new standard clinical attire, and I use standard loosely, because there is none, uh, what should they be doing to protect the doctor and the team? Let's start with CDC. Their recommendation is long sleeves, high neck, and at long enough going down to the point where when you sit down, it covers your lap. That's the recommendation from CDC. Some years ago, well, I, I lived with Dr. Rella Christensen, as you know, who is an infection control guru. And therefore, I, I took that on because uh, I, I didn't want a family fight. Uh, and I've worn that for a long time. There are many, many groups out there that make such a gown. And uh, the one we particularly use, and it's not that it's any better, is Landau, L-A-N-D-A-U. 
it covers the entire, the entire body and has tight, tight, uh, puckered up sleeves that you can put the glove up over. However, uh, some years ago, I tried to find a number of those in my local community. Now we're in a community uh, in Utah that probably has 300 to 400,000 in it. And there are quite a few uniform shops, so-called. I found one now. So what are dentists wearing? Well, uh, I don't even have to say it. Scrubs, which are the what? They are the underwear of a general surgeon. The underwear of a general surgeon. Because we think a drop is bad. They think a pouring a pint of blood on them is bad. You know, we're, we're so small in our the development of, well, try an orthopedic surgeon. Packing a bone with a, essentially a hacksaw. Right, uh, the aerosol is everywhere, so we are minuscule. What should the uh, overall attire be? I, I am now with the CDC, but I'm going to say another thing, negative. I hate to be negative, but we've, we've dealt with this problem so long that I'm very frustrated with it, as you can see. If I were in London today, Europe, and I was operating, High neck, long sleeves have been illegal. The Brits say, what, what should we do? The Brits say, we should have bare arms and then we can wash those arms down and clean them up and go back in. Two developed countries diametrically opposed, diametrically opposed. And in the US, it's a joke. We made an infection control video some time ago and I took the CDC recommendations, one by one by one by one. And we went through them and tried to mediate them to the point where you could actually do them. If I did everything as stated in their suggestions, what do you do? What do you do all day long? Oh, I clean my arm. That's all you would do. Uh, so in mediating them, uh, we got down to the point where you could do most of them fairly adequately. And that, that little video, by the way, you're looking at my name in the back there. More information anytime you want, pccdental.com. And you will see, let me give you another website, pccdental.com gets our educational information. The other one is, this is one long word, small or lowercase, cliniciansreport.org. No spaces, no dots, cliniciansreport.org. Go to the home page, scroll down to the bottom, and there's innumerable, there are innumerable pieces of information in great detail on what we've been talking about. With the actual studies, with the actual references, clinicianreport.org, bottom of the home page. Go there and you'll get uh, far more than you want, but at least it'll get you updated to, to where you are. So, uh, lost my train of thought. Where was I? I was on the tire. I'm, I'm going to say because I've been dealing with, with uh, Dr. Rella and some of our research, there is no good clinical attire. When I'm really practicing, I'll see anywhere between 20 and 70 patients in a day, and uh, that will include the staff. I want you to think about disposable wear. We'd have to back a semi-trailer up to the office. It isn't like a general surgeon going in for four hours with one gown on. We go in for four minutes on a hygiene. You, you know what I'm saying? So to say we're going to solve a tire, wrong. Uh, not unless you go bankrupt in the first month. Uh, there is no way without uh, doing some Rube Goldberg thing. I'll tell you what I'm doing. We're taking the patient cover, which is basically a, a, a cover of the, just at the front of the patient, and I'm putting that on the front of me when I'm into a very aerosol producing situation, such as cutting five or six preps. Where's the junk gonna be? I'll stand up, the junk's gonna be right there. So if I have that patient cover on me, I picked up the majority of it to throw away. And my hands are gonna be right there and I've already got gloves on and the gloves cover the uh, sleeves so I'm, yeah, I'm getting it over here, but not much because the gown, not the gown, that cover covers most of my body. So that's what I'm doing, but I know very well it's not adequate. 
And I don't know, what is that again? What are we going to do? Go in there naked and take a shower after every patient? That's probably a good idea. I, I, I don't know. I, I think we'll get into other issues and problems with that one. Gord, what I'm going to do is, uh, for the viewers who are watching this uh, on YouTube, each of those links that you mentioned, I'll put those in the description below so that all you have to do is click on them and they'll take you right to those sites that uh, okay, Dr. Okay, perfect, oh, perfect. That one cliniciansreport.org, it's got an enormous amount of information on and that we, we keep about 10 years of research on there. We've been running uh, clinicians report for 43 years and uh, we keep only about 10 years of research uh, because uh, it goes out of date very fast. We, Science is, is only temporary. I think you know that. What's true today will be false tomorrow. Let me give you an example. You learned that strep mutans cause dental caries. I'll bet, I'll bet 99% of you did. Guess what? Our latest research shows <laughs> we've identified 150 organisms by genus and species, and strep mutans is not even in 40% of dental caries. That, that's historic junk from the 1800s that every dental school still teaches. There's so much of that. Science just revolves around in a big circle. It's a moving target. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. While we're on the subject of uh, PPE and, and face masks, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about the KN95 and, and how the FDA banned the use of faulty masks from over 65 of the, uh, the overseas manufacturers. So. How does a dentist, how does a doctor determine what is safe and effective when it comes to the masks for the doctor and for the team? You don't. Uh, when you see people, this is directly related. The most dangerous thing I consider every day that I do, every day that I practice, is going to the grocery store. <laughs> it is not being in the operatory. And that, 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 that analogy says it all. Uh, you go to the, to the grocery store, you see nine tenths of them with no mask on, hardly anybody with gloves on, and you think, wow, what's going on? Now, then you go in the office and worry about one microbe on an instrument. Wow, it is, it, it is cognitive dissonance. I am a psychologist as well. We call that cognitive dissonance, where we know what's right, but we can't do it for some reason. And uh, infection control is in that category. You go to the restaurant, you pick up a salt shaker. Is that disinfected? No, the guy picked his nose right before he put the salt in it. Uh, you go in the public bathroom, you flush the toilet. Do you wash your hands after you go to the toilet? No, you wash them after you flush it. You think about it with me for a minute. We, we have two separate worlds, one idealistic, one realistic. I hope I've not been objectionably realistic today. No, I, I think you gave some really good graphic points there. Um, it, it's interesting that you mentioned the uh, the grocery store because a number of months ago, probably probably a couple of months ago, in the early days of the pandemonium, um, I was one of the first people at grocery stores to be wearing masks and gloves. And I said to myself, I had this conscious discussion with myself, I know it's going to look weird because only a few Asians who understood you know, the, the spread they, they and I were the only people in the grocery store at that time who were wearing anything protective. And now Massachusetts anyway has mandated in in public. So now about a, almost 100% of people in the grocery stores are wearing masks and gloves. But up until very recently, that wasn't the case. So your point is really well taken. Yeah, we're, we're still at the point where I see hardly anybody. I just pick a time when that nobody's going to be there. And, and I feel relatively comfortable, but it is the most dangerous thing I do all week. <laughs> wow. While we're still on that topic of PPE, how, how about your recommendations for uh, selection, evaluation and selection of the appropriate gloves? You mentioned gloves. Oh, Talk the appropriate that. gloves. Okay. That subject uh, is one of frustration to me because every year, not every year, but periodically, gloves get thinner and thinner and thinner. I, I, <clears throat> almost all the gloves are made in Malaysia. You may not know that. And I, I went through some of those factories while I was there. Exam gloves should be used for exam only. If you're doing anything that's really involved with much blood, don't use exam blood, gloves. We found everything from mice feces to actually cockroaches to ants. Uh, many of them are made in situations that are not particularly <laughs> infection control prone. Uh, so exam gloves are basically for that. 
for examination just to protect you and to some degree the patient. But as far as anything surgical, and a lot of you are doing implants, all of you are taking teeth out, 90% of you, you need surgical gloves. Now you're going to pay some, or you're going to pay a lot more because you can get an exam glove for five cents, seven cents, ten cents, and you're going to pay a dollar or more, or put on up to four or five dollars for a good surgical glove. But if you had somebody in your mouth with mice feces on their glove, I don't think I'm exaggerating, but I don't think you would want that to happen. So two levels of gloves. Uh, exam is for non-buddy and uh, there aren't very many non-buddy things unless you got a rubber dam on and uh, surgical gloves are for anything where you're really anticipating uh, getting a situation that would provide the microorganisms or viruses into the bloodstream how do you know which gloves are good basically they're categorized into exam and surgical stay with the surgical I know you got more overhead and that's another thing. Uh, do we charge for that overhead or not? And I'm saying most patients are dissatisfied with it. The actual research showed more than 80% of patients said charging for infection control is, is not acceptable. So you don't want to lose patients at this point. So build it into the fee. I don't know what the fee is anyway. It's easier to build it into the fee. Uh, you have so far so many of your answers and they've been great because so many of them are certainly not what I expected and I have my ear to the ground so to speak with the dentists uh, throughout the yeah. US Canada and around the world and you certainly have have come up even the, the simple thought of having two different levels of glove and paying five to ten times or more we're gonna we're gonna come back to the question of cost and PPE but let's let's go to the donning and removal that just blows my mind because not just the cost of the extra safety equipment, but the cost in time to properly put it on and take it off. So how do you see that may change the way that we move from room to room? So for example, we're in the middle of doing, as you say, five preps, and we get up and do a hygiene check and then have to come back. How do you see that changing, if at all? Uh, it won't change for me very much, but I think for a typical dentist, it, it probably will change. Some some dentists wash gloves between patients, which is bad news, but that's actually done. Some will go into a room and not put gloves on for an exam. You just pick up the handle of the mirror, which is bad news. So there are a lot of things that, uh, that I see that will change because of the patient perception of uh, whether your office is clean or not and the psychologic damage uh, that is being done by, by this uh, overall pandemic is, is and clearly identified in the psychologic channels, which I uh, subscribe to. Uh, they're claiming we may have more damage to the overall world population psychologically than the 100,000 in the U.S. that have died physiologically because we're dealing now with the younger people who are terrified, as I was as a young kid going through some of these things. They're terrified, they don't know that their parents can do anything to help them. Uh, let's go to the psychology for a minute. Yes, we're going to be changing. All dentists are going to be changing. The upgrade in infection control is mandatory. It's gonna cost money. Our, our research shows one dentist, one assistant, you have around $20 of cost just to get one butt in the seat. Now you add another, I, I always work with two assistants, sometimes more if I'm doing something complex, and that's, that adds another 20 if you got two more there. So you, you haven't done anything. You've done a denture check and you just paid, <laughs> you just paid $20 just to do that and there's no charge for it. So obviously you have gotta add something on to that overall fee. It's gonna change markedly, yeah. at least for a while. Uh, no, no, no doubt at all. Now, we were talking just a moment ago about those fees, so I'm gonna take you back a little bit. During the AIDS epidemic, yeah. during AIDS, some dentists began charging at that point what they called the infection control fee. That was kind of the beginning of that. Yeah. Yeah. And as you mentioned a moment ago, many doctors today are not just considering, but they're actually already charging the PPE fee per visit. Yeah. Yes. Now, on the one hand, you know, some of them have told me, oh, my patients seem very understanding and they're not pushing back. But on the flip side, and this is a much bigger concern to me, and I think it should be to them, 
dentists are becoming the target of social media firestorms in their local communities. And yeah, I can understand both sides, the patient's point of view and also the, the cost to the dentist. But uh, I, I think I already know your answer based on what you what you said. And I think we're both of the mindset that you just can't say to a patient, there's a 20 or 30 or whatever number fee for this. You have to figure out another way to pay for it. Yeah, you do, you do. They, they know basically in the community what a trophy costs. They, they know what a radiograph costs. They, they know a few of those things that is very common knowledge. They don't know what a, whatever a crown costs or a composite and is it one service, two service, three service, and so forth. They, they don't know that. So it's easy to add on a dribble to your fees and uh, that I think it's mandatory. And psychologically, I don't like to nitpick down to the specific things. Although that's done in hospitals routinely, you get $10 for an aspirin and you get all kinds of crazy things. By the time you're done, you, you have a whole page of nitpicking things like that. That does turn me on, particularly as a psychologist, I would say it's very negative to your practice. I'm, I'm glad we're in accord on that because it, it's really been a concern for me listening to, again, the dentist saying, well, my patients seem fine with it because it'll take one patient for that to blow up in their face uh, in the oh, whole yeah. community. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when dentists first began seeing emergency patients at the start of the pandemic, they would tell their patients, uh, you know, make, when you come, stay in your car, text us or call us and, and we'll know that you're here. Uh, we're not going to bring you into the reception room when we know that you're here and we're ready for you. We'll escort you directly into the treatment room. So I've heard some dentists saying that their states have actually started mandating that type of a change in patient flow. So my question is, do you think it's possible that the reception or what we used to call the waiting room, but the reception room is a thing of the past or will there be modifications, including fewer chairs, greater distance, partitions, social distancing that will allow for a hybrid or revised reception room of the future? Let's say we don't have a resurgence of COVID, which we're likely to have, but let's say we don't. I'll give us about six months and guess what? We're going to be right back where we were before this pandemic. I, I really think that. But uh, because so many people are not uh, observing the suggestions that have been made, as we all know, uh, ad infinitum, or we've been on that so long. So what is going to happen there? Uh, I'll tell you what I'm now doing, and it's a psychologic procedure, not a physiologic one. Well, there's a little physiology in it. They call, literally, they're outside the door. We have a sign right on the door that says, uh, please call us and we will have one of the receptionists come and, and take your temperature. Now, do I need to do that? It's not likely that anybody at say 100.2 rather than 100.4, which is what CDC is saying, uh, we had a couple yesterday that were 99.6, and I'm thinking, big deal. I just ran in out of a hot day. It's uh, 80 to 90 degrees out there. But in the meantime, we're taking temperature. We're shooting them in the head, and we take temperature, and that's recorded. And then we have a little storm. Now, if you go to cliniciansreport.org, you'll find right at the bottom of that homepage, free of charge, you'll find this form, which we're asking. I, I'm not asking them. The dental uh, receptionist is out there with gloves on and mask on, standing uh, as far away as she can, asking the questions. And they cannot enter the door until they answer the questions appropriately and, uh, and uh, they, the temperature is below 100.4. I really like, uh, I like better to say anywhere in the 99, I'm a little concerned. But anyway, they're walking in now. They got gloves on. They've got a mask on. They're ushered down the aisle to the operatory, which has been prepared for them, and it has a, uh, a barrier on the chair and the arms, and uh, they'll be treated, and they're ushered right back out again, out the door, and the financial arrangements are, are made outside the door as they find them. Now, how long am I going to do that? Not as long as, not as long, a uh, very short time, let's say that. But at this time, since dentists have been beat up severely by the press. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say something that will irritate some of you. Physicians are far less involved with infection control and dentists in the outpatient area. I've done a lot of hospital dentistry. In the outpatient area, I know you've gone in, had somebody fondle your various parts with no gloves on, 
somebody who, uh, you know, has been into some of your orifices and all they do is just wipe the slime off their hands. Uh, we are far better than our medical colleagues, but the public doesn't know. I tell public routinely in a, in a less obnoxious way than I just told you that we are right on the top of outpatient infection control in dentistry. Not, not in the middle, not on the bottom as we're portrayed. We're right on the top. So be proud of it and tell your patients that. We're doing everything we can do to protect you. And we've been through these before again and again and again. This is just another W wonderful information. Gordon, uh, you know, for decades, uh, decades, you've been an inspiration, uh, really a guiding light for the profession. I, I thank you so much for all you've done and, and especially for taking the time to share with us today. I'm delighted. Thank you, Tom. Uh, your gems are wonderful. Uh, we need more pragmatic things just like you. Uh, there, there are too many pie in the sky things, you know, our whole organization is, is oriented toward the 97% of them, it's not the 3% pie in the sky group, and they're, they're, they get all the publication, but we really treat people, we, you, me, we treat people with uh, minimal money, with, with uh, problems with family and so forth, we are a health profession, we're not a money profession. If I wanted to, to make money, I'd go out and sell marijuana or cocaine or something like that, make some money. But in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, thank you for putting these together and getting this information. It's my pleasure. Truly my pleasure. And um, be well and to your family and Rella and uh, the, the dentists and, and your whole family. Be well. Take care. Thank you so much again. Same, same to you. Thank you. Keep it up. Thanks. Take care. If you found this video helpful, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification so you won't miss a thing. If you're not yet a GEMS family member, Elizabeth and I would be delighted to help you build your practice and your revenue. We'd love to have you with us here on Planet GEMS for a time-limited offer, a free test drive of GEMS membership. Visit dentalgoldmine.com. There's a link in the description below. If this was helpful, click like. Thanks for joining Dr. Christensen and me here in the Dental Goldmine. And remember, you're only one gem away.